Good day and welcome to JCC Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. We would love to have you. Our title today in our lesson is called Separating the Sheep and the Goat, coming from Matthew 25, verse 31 through 36. If I could give a suggested title today, I would like to call it Set Aside for the Work of God. Our lesson this week shows us a parable of the sheep and the goat that also has a prophetic picture of the end time. Christ uses this parable or this prophecy to illustrate his reign as king and also his authorization as judge. We will see how he referenced our obligation as faithful Christians to help fellow believers in need. The text today is used to reveal the importance of living in a light of future events. Yes, if we're believers in Christ, we will give our lives in service to him now to reap the blessings of the future. This will involve helping those in need. Part of being a disciple of God involves helping other believers who are in need. Let's begin this dynamic lesson and see what it has to offer us today. Our first outline deals with the judging of the righteous. We know the Bible says that all will be judged as well as the righteous. So our text is going to show the judgment will come about on how we treat other people. Christ is showing that in the future event, there will be a gathering before the separation. So before we begin this lesson, let's ask one question and use the verses to begin to answer it. Question one. When will the event that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 25, 31 take place? I'm going to see this is dealing with the gathering. And we're going to find the answer to this question in verse 31 and 32. Let's read them. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep. From the gates. The text says, When the Son of Man shall come, meaning it is a prescribed time, but unknown to us. The time frame is prior to the establishment of the millennial kingdom. But Christ uses this name, Son of Man, for himself. He's shown us as he describes the moment he takes his glorious throne after arriving here with his angels. He returns now as king and judge. And now, like I say, he's getting ready to begin the judgment process of two different groups, which we're going to find out about in our next outline in verse 33, as it deals with dividing. Dividing deals with separation. So there's going to be a great separation. So question two says, how did Jesus refer to these two kingdoms of the people who are divided or separated? Let's read verse 33 and find out. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats, on his left. Here, Jesus refers to those on his right hand as sheep and those on his left as goats. The sheep represents believers, while the goat represents unbelievers. It would not be possible for anyone to fool the Lord at this time. I want us to see in the text, it's showing us that Christ will know who are really sheep and who are really goats. But he shows us a process of separation. This process of separation is a form of judgment. And this is the real judgment, the real separation that Christ is going to bring about in this day and time. The eternal fate of any non-believer is going to be declared on the great white throne judgment. That is referred to in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. But believers have their eternal judgment in the judgment seat of Christ, which we can see in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. Let's read that one. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We see that, that judgment, it comes about as we look, as Christ will look and see what we have accomplished in this life. This process is called the Bema Seat, and it's a judgment of each Christian. It's not to determine who will enter into heaven, because the Bible says we are forgiven at the moment of salvation. And you can find that in Psalms 103, verses 10 through 12. But it does show us that this beam of seat that our, is going to be a judgment of believers, that the Bible says we will get our rewards at this time. But these rewards are based on our actions 
that are found in him. You can find that in Psalm 62 and 12. What we have done for him speaks to that old song we used to sing. May the works I've done speak for me. This parallels what James says in his epistle. In James 2, it says, faith without work is dead. We respond to our Lord in faith because he imputed his righteousness to us, which is found in Romans 1, 17. We will receive reward based on what we did with our lives as ambassadors of Christ. We need to know that we as ambassadors do what we are told to do, not a diplomat who does what they want to do. And we're going to see the correlation between the sheep and the goat as we deal with this. Works do not save us, but they do go hand in hand with our salvation. A saved person works to glorify God and help edify others. This here will come more evident as we get into our lesson. So it's important that we see this point. God has an expectation that we as believers work and we will be rewarded for that work. But what is the work we need to be doing? We'll find that out in the next series of verses. Before we read the next few verses, questions three and four ask, question three says, which group will be invited to the kingdom? And what is the significance of the right-hand side in the scriptures that we're about to read? Let's read verse 34 and find out. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. It is this group that's on the right side, on the right hand of God, that's going to be invited to enter into the kingdom with him. Notice what he calls them in the text. He calls them blessed. They are blessed of his father. This here blessing is a day of celebration. It's a day that brings about a happiness because they know they are entering into the kingdom of God. They will be in, in eternal fellowship in the presence of God forever. He calls this group the sheep. This is the group that is the sheep. And these are those who have put their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. They are the true Christian chosen by God to receive his gracious forgiveness for their sins. But it's all based on their faith in Christ and their obedience to him as the Lord of their lives. The sheep will be invited into the kingdom, which has been prepared. He said it's been prepared from the foundation of earth. God knew from the beginning of time who was going to be with him in heaven, in this kingdom. He said they will be seated on the right hand. Now, the right hand is viewed as a place of honor and authority. We're going to see that these here sheep, these here believers, these true Christians are going to be in a place of honor and authority. Verse 35 and 36 are going to speak of those works done in obedience. Verse 35 reads, For I was an hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Question five asks us, what does Jesus say they did to qualify them for this invitation? He explains that this group is being invited because they did six things. And these six things brought about a benefit to him. Watch this here. He says, when he was hungry, they gave him food. When he was thirsty, they gave him something to drink. When he was a stranger, they took him in and cared for him. When he was naked, they gave him clothing. When he was sick, they visited him and nursed him. When he was in prison, they came to him. And this here revealed a caring heart, a caring spirit. Now, these six things are the work of outreach ministry. This is the business of helping other people. This is one of the most essential parts of our church ministry today. Meeting people where they are to help them in their situation. Christ is now about to show them the evidence of, of righteousness in these next few verses. He's going to show what righteousness really look like and who are really righteous. Let's read verses 37 and 30 through 39. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hunger and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick in, or in prison and came unto thee? We see here, initially, they have a sense of confusion. Question six is, why are they surprised and confused by Jesus' statement? It's because they didn't even remember seeing him, let alone doing these things for him. They 
This is a place where they didn't realize Jesus was even present during this time. And question seven is, what practical lesson can we learn from this here? Today, we ought to anticipate Christ's coming. We must remain aware of his circumstance around us. These circumstances include meeting the needs that people face on a daily basis. We cannot allow ourselves to become so engrossed in the study of, of the future, of the prophetic, of the things that are come, and we forget about taking care of the work that is before us right now. See, the church sometimes is so wrapped in itself or the things that we think will make the church better physically. When Christ is saying we simply need to focus on the needs of those in need now through outreach. This is how we get our reward from God in the kingdom. Not just knowing the Bible, but doing the work that needs to be done for those, the least of these, are our brethren or our sisters. We need to be taking care of the needs of those who are in need right now, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Christ now is going to come back and give them some assurance of he was there. Watch this in verse 40. He says, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Wow. Christ, as the king answers this here, their confusion, he goes in and shows them that with this profound answer, he said, if you done it to my brethren, you did it unto me. Notice he used the term brethren, meaning those in the family. These are believers. The world is not family. The Bible calls the world its enemy. Those who love other brothers and serve them prove by their actions that they are true followers of Christ. And you can find this in John chapter 14, verse 15. When God's people care for each other, it is as if they are caring for Jesus himself. When a believer shows Christ's love for him by obedience, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, meaning that you will be obedient to my commandments. That there reflects a service. It reflects a devotion to God. So loving our brothers is a sign of true faith. In other words, Jesus is trying to show us that loving, see, Jesus sees the loving care believers give to each other as if it was being done to him directly. He said, if you can love your brother and your sister, then you can show, you're showing that you're really loving me, even though you don't see me. See, it's important to note that the reason these people did these things was because they were living faithfully for Jesus. See, their works follow their faith. It, when we allow our works to follow our faith, it, it allows us to see that we have chose him over the world, or over ourselves. I don't have time to go into it right now, but we cannot see faith only as believing in God. Many times in our Bibles, in our studies, we look at faith as only a mere believing. But the Bible teaches us that faith has a few aspects to it. One of the spiritual aspects of faith is being obedient. That obedient faith, which is the working aspect of faith. We show our faithfulness by our works and actions for others. Yes, we need believing faith. We need a faith that's trustworthy, that we put our trust in God. But we need what James called as that working faith tied to our actions. And this is the, what righteous sheep portrayed as they were rewarded for it, as we see here, Christ saying. Christ now will show us the left hand. And the left hand is going to result in the judging of the unrighteous. So question eight says, what is Jesus' message for the ones on his left side? Let's see what it says in verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, he cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus explains those who are on the left side, what is going to happen to them? He says they have to be departed. Why? Because they are cursed. This is a decree or a judgment that sets their destination. He sets their destination, and that destination is in everlasting fire, which is a picture of hell, which has been prepared for Satan and his angels, he says. Everyone who rejects Christ and his work are destined for hell. Hell is for rebelliousness. Those who choose to rebel spend eternity in a place of rebellion. And God will allow all those who would not accept his free gift of salvation to spend eternity in hell. 
So Christ helps us to understand why they are headed there in the next few verses. Let's read them. For I was an hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Notice that word, that last word, minister. Meaning, when was it that we did not see you and serve you? When did we not serve what you needed in that day and time? Question nine says, how does Jesus explain this decision? Again, he shows those same six principles that the sheep did do, the goats did not do. The same exact things. See, this time, he shows that they did not meet the need. They said, when did we not minister unto you? Christ is saying, you didn't meet my need. You didn't minister to the needs of my people, of my brethren, of the things that they needed. They failed to care for him or the least of these that we know that he's, he talks about. Whenever a believer suffers in whatever need it might be, when a believer suffers and that need is not met, it shows that Christ said you didn't do what you were supposed to do. See, Jesus holds these unbelievers accountable for the sin of neglect. James 4 and 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and do it not to him, it is a sin. Let me read that again. Therefore, to him that know to do good and don't do it, it is a it to him, it is a sin. See, when we fail to do what God asks of us, it always results in sin. Why? Because we missed the mark. We're being disobedient. In verse 44, they claim not to have seen Christ in that situation, claiming to sin, if I had known it was you. I would have done it. That might be true and it may not be true, but it still results because of disobedience. It still results in sin. See, claiming we would have done something for Jesus if we would have known it was him. It's saying again, like James 2 and 1, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, would respect the person. We're not to pick favorites whom we want to serve. God says serve the least of these. Serve your brethren, the least of your brethren. Serve those who are of the faith that are in need. We are to serve them. Christ makes this affirmation in verse 45. Let's read it. He says, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, In so much as you did it not unto the least of these, you did it unto me. Jesus answers that their failure to meet the needs of those who suffer was a failure to meet his own needs. Their lack of help for others is something that Jesus is showing us he took personally. And when we see a brethren or a sister in Christ in need and we pass them by, it's just like we pass by Christ. And Christ takes this personal. It affects whether our works for Christ is on the right-hand side or are they the results of a left-handed Christian. And we know a left-handed Christian is a Christian that's carnal-minded. Someone who is doing it for self, all about self and not about the work of God. He now delivers the judgment of eternal separation in verse 46. He says, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Notice this again. He says the destination for those who don't take care of the needs of the people because they're living a life of separation from him here on earth will eternally live a life of separation in hell. He said, because they didn't do the work, it was on this side. They won't reap the benefits or reward on the other side. Only those who are righteous, those sheep in the right hand, the righteous one will live an eternal life in heaven. Question 10 says, what are the two eternal destinations and what determines one's destiny? We know there are two eternal destinations that we can live in today. People are either for Jesus, and if they are for Jesus, they're believers, or they're not for Christ, and they are unbelievers who refuse to accept him. There's no middle ground. There there will be no second chance for those who come to the end of life on this earth without having trusted in Christ. 
So it requires us to put our trust in Christ on this side. And as we put our trust in him, then it requires for us to be obedient to do the work that he's called us to do. What we do about Jesus now has eternal implications that determine our destination, which is either going to heaven or it's going to hell. Again, there's no in-between place. The Bible is clear. We are either going up or we're going down. The choice is ours, though. It is determined by who we have put in charge of our eternal destination. Do we take matters in our own hands or do we put our life in the hands of God? If it's the Lord, we should be working while it is day or night cometh and no man can work. If it's in our own, I beseech you, brethren, repent now. Make Christ the Lord of your life and believe God raised him from the dead and put your hands to the plow and never look back. This concludes our lesson. We've learned that judgment will come to us all. But what we do on this side determines what destination we end up on the other side. We also brought in the book of James to remind us in this letter that our faith is no good if we do not show it through our works. Our faith has to be translated into an an action. Someone needs to see our faith in action, see it working. The church must seek actively to help those in need. If not, In the end, Christ will separate sheep from goat. And we do not want to be the one in the left hand. Let us not be a left-handed Christian, but I pray to God that we all are right-handed believers. To God be the glory. Well, that ends our lesson for this week. I hope that you've enjoyed it. If so, please, I ask that you would take the time to give us a thumbs up, give us some confirmation on what you liked about the lesson, what you didn't like about the lesson. Let us know how you feel about it. Help us to try to make this here uh, assignment that God has us on in teaching a Sunday school lesson. Help us to make it better. Help us to fulfill our goal and destiny that God has us on. Well, that's all for now. Come back next week. Same time, same channel. Be blessed now.